Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Crash landing through your stereo system, this is none other than the lost voice at WCAT Radio. And of course, the person who's speaking is John Studi, the one who you would expect to give some sort of weird, awkward, quirky intro, which is fine. But the good news for all you listeners of The Lost Voice is that our voice of wisdom has returned, or at least our voice of stability. Jacob Nelson <laughs> is back and in prime form. Like Optimus Jacob. Prime? Yes. I'm in my optimal form. You are in your optimal form. In fact, you need the life cube. Is that what it's called? I haven't seen that movie in forever. I have, I have not the faintest idea. I just remember playing with Transformers That's as a true. kid. Also, I remember being you know, playing with Transformers jealous. like a week ago. What? Oh, yeah, actually, yeah, I was playing with Transformers <laughs> on that day. In your, in your basement. <laughs> because it's, um, <laughs> in my basement. Yeah. Do you remember playing Transformer with Transformers today. together? Oh, yeah. Shh. Jake, you can't really make the listeners know that the main reason why I had kids is because I wanted to play with all the toys. Well, that's true. Which actually, there's an element of truth to that. For instance, um, the kids have been watching a show called PJ Mask from uh, from time to time, and the show is really funny, um, or not really funny, but uh, it's a uh, it's really cute. It's developed on the show. Um, I would say it's you know easily up there with the shows that you and I wa- you and I watched as a kid in terms of its storyline and its uh, the writing and everything and the characters, just really good. Um, and it's a great excuse for me to watch it because I can't get away with that on my own. It's kind of weird for a grown man to be watching cartoons. Like the whole My Little Pony thing. Remember that? Anybody remember that? Yes, that you and our other friends, especially Mr. Schwarzbauer, said that My Little Pony was a great show to watch, and I insisted that no man would ever watch it so freely unless they were watching it with their kids. Yeah. Is that that what you're recalling? Yeah, that's what I'm recalling. (laughs) You know, I only watched a little bit of it. I didn't watch the whole uh, quite as much okay. as the short. That's power. not the no, way no, you no. made it sound before. But you should like quote every episode. I can't. I have like two episodes that I remember. You had like stuffed animals of them all. I remember you had footy PJs of My Little Ponies, and you would wear them out to like Perkins with us. <laughs> yeah, well, Jake, this is true. But if you recall, at our last pajama party. So, like, Saturday. I re- remember, or I seem to remember somebody wearing a... So you can't like even come up with a lie beep. that's believable right now. No, I heard a beep. What was that beep? Oh, it was the doorbell at work. Oh, okay, it sounded like somebody came into our show. I'm like, no, oh, no, no. The show. Who, who would They're call into this train wreck? I don't know. I mean, we had a real live <laughs> professor, somebody with an actual doctor calling in last week. Wow. I know. But you scheduled that. I Well, kind of. Actually, asked him the day of. Yeah. It was, it was by no means. <laughs> I don't think we've had a single live phone call. Wait, no, never mind. Lisa it's called. It's been a while. Uh, Lisa called once. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, I was shocked that we didn't have any last time. Evie called once. Oh, yeah. And then she, like, awkwardly hung on the line. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Evie. Oh, I mean, uh, you're the best. Yeah. Anyway, you can call in today if you so desire to uh, join us on this hour excursion down the rail tracks of insanity. Uh, John, what's the uh, the phone number? Do you know it? Uh, we are hey. live, and well, I only have I only have the toll free number, and I'm not sure that it works because nobody ever calls in. Oh, it should. <laughs> Well, I can give the toll-free number, which is 844-801-6666, and then dial access code 914121, and you will be on air with us uh, going down the rails of insanity, which is this train wreck of a show. And um, in case that phone number doesn't work, we're going to give you six others. <laughs> <laughs> Just joking. The one that I call. 
I don't remember the toll-free number being one that you call before. But eight, uh, the number I call is 515-604-9344 with the same access code of 914-121, followed by pound. Excellent. Don't okay. pound your phone. You got, the, you know, can, you, the hash can you tell us where we were last year? Last week? I have no idea. I did not listen. No, 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 no. Not where we were, but where you were. Oh, oh where I was? Yeah. Come on, Jay, that was a whole week ago. <laughs> you think I remember a week ago? Uh, you give me too much credit. I do. I was in a grand excursion somewhere in this world. Or maybe not in this world. I don't recall. Which makes me think, remember that time when we were doing a... Uh, uh, a camp, extreme faith camp, and we were, you and I were having our evening meeting after all the oh, kids went yeah. to bed, and you, and you saw a UFO. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was horrible. Uh, the uh, I swear there was no drinking involved. Um, it is true. Because, I verify this. Yeah, I was there, too, um, and there was no drinking. Um, I can <laughs> verify it, my own testimony as well. Um, but anyway, we were sitting down looking at the stars. We were talking about something. I don't remember what it was, but it was late, really late. And I saw, you know, this is unusual. You look at the night sky, and sometimes you'll see, you know, small little, you know, little reflections of satellites or a, or a shooting star or something like that. Um, but I, I looked up in the sky, and there were there were two objects that were moving towards each other. They were zigzagging back back and forth, and I found that to be you know a rather unusual pattern. And um, eventually, they uh, they actually met up, and then they turned uh, 90 degrees away from each or uh, and completely away from each other, um, and flew off in their own direction in a straight line. I was a little freaked out. Not gonna lie. I didn't know what was going on. Um, Jake was just laughing at me. He swear it wasn't U- he he said it wasn't a UFO. But I know it is. I know the truth. It's the reptilian people. You mean there, yeah. you, you saw the, the interview with Mark Zuckerberg in front of con- Congress, right? His his uh, his hearing. <laughs> I saw some of it. He is without a doubt an alien. That's fair. I'm yeah. pretty sure if they made Men in Black today, he would be one of the people in there that turned out to be an alien, like Dennis Rodman. Oh, yeah. He, he's, he's definitely a lizard person, too. So, in any case, besides all of that, we're going to pick up where we left off a couple weeks ago, uh, talking about creation, and mm-hmm. specifically in this case. So last time we talked about the macro account of creation and the correspondence of day one to four, or five to or sorry, one to four, two to five, and three to six. Um, And I had uh, another thought that I wanted to throw in uh, on the macro kind of evolution, and Studi, you can uh, run from there with it if you please. And then we thought we'd get into the micro account of uh, creation and God making man and woman and talking a little bit about theology of the body with that and some negative anthropology, which is uh, awesome. I love negative anthropology. And it's not because I'm a negative person, but because it's very useful. So one thing I wanted to, uh, I was reflecting on after our last show, is we talked about the first six days of creation, and I think we touched on the seventh day, uh, but I was thinking through it more, uh, because we're made in God's image, which means that we do things like God. We don't do things that God does specifically, like we can't create out of nothing, but we do fashion one thing into another, such as uh, raw material into a computer, or into a car, or that sort of thing. And so we, we manipulate and we create based on our power and the image and likeness of God. And so in that way, we reflect the first six days of creation. Uh, but the seventh day, what did God do? He rested, not for his own sake, but for ours, so that we understand the importance of rest, uh, because we need that. But... Uh, or so, in any case, this is outlined in the Decalogue to keep holy the Sabbath day, to keep the seventh day as a day of rest. Uh, but as Christians, we don't hold the Sabbath as the seventh day or a Saturday like the Jews do. Uh, we, uh, our holy day is Sunday, which is in the book of Isaiah referred to as the eighth day. It's the day of the resurrection. Uh, and so what happens on the eighth day? All is recreated. Uh, and so on the eighth day, we are called to recreate or be renewed, which does not mean to sit around and do nothing. It doesn't mean to not do any work whatsoever. 
It means to do things that renew, refresh, and recreate you so you can go out uh, and work again for the next six days uh, for the kingdom of God. And so, like, John, you and I have very um, uh, low-key jobs in terms of the fact that we do a lot of office work, which means that for being recreated, it might mean doing more laborious things, not servile work, not work for no purpose, mm. but to do things that, you know, rejuvenate our bodies, which might be a workout, it might be sport. Um, you know, I, I really... Mowing the lawn, changing sure, kids I mean, to go inside. Yeah, I mean, actually mowing the lawn for me is rather therapeutic. Um, it's not for me. We, we just, well, it's... <laughs> <laughs> That's because your lawnmower down, situation has been uh, pretty rough. Do I have to fix your lawnmower again, by the way? No, what? what? No, I haven't, I haven't fixed it yet. Your lawnmower works? No. Oh, so I do need to fix it again. Oh, yes, yes. Okay. Well, I yes. should teach you how to fix it, because you know what they say, fix a lawnmower for a man, he has a fixed lawnmower. Teach a man to fix a lawnmower, he'll still bug you to come over and have a beer. So you that's what, what we say. should do. He build a fire for a man. He'll be warm for the night. If you set a man on fire, he'll be warm <laughs> for the rest of his life. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> oh, that's Why do you associate with me? Because um, <laughs> I love you, Levy. The dangers involved with this, Jake. Yes. But anyway, um, so on the eighth day or Sunday, we're supposed to imitate God and act like he does. Uh, and what he did on Sunday was to recreate creation, uh, and so we're to be recreated. And you know, um, that doesn't mean that we should just throw all caution to the wind and do whatever on on a, a Sunday. Uh, we should still act with meaning and purpose, um, because we shouldn't act on Sunday in a way that drains us for the beginning of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, but it does mean that we are, you know, not supposed to just sit around and do nothing. We are supposed to um, do things that help us be renewed and rejuvenated. And, and so that should always be rooted in things like prayer, uh, obviously going to Mass, uh, maybe stopping in an adoration, or you know, doing something rooted in, in prayer is always good. Um, but then also keeping in mind what does the rest of your day look like in terms of family life. Um, you know, like you said, mowing the lawn for some can be therapeutic, like my dad has a riding lawnmower, that would be an awesome Sunday activity in my book. <laughs> uh, Especially if you're racing somebody. Right? So, in any case, I was thinking about that. that um, racing the somebody day on or keeping the, the Sabbath holy is really about uh, uh, living in a manner that um, imitates what God had done. And on the eighth day or on our holy day as Christians, it's to be recreated as Christ recreated. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and that uh, reminds me, of my, my pastor recently gave a talk to my youth um, about how we're made for greatness, not comfort, in, in his yeah. talk, uh, which was great, which was great. He uh, touched on the subject of recreation, and he went to the exact same uh, definition or the t same distinctions you did as you have uh, recreation and recreation. Um, and they, we usually think of recreation as playing video games and mm -hmm. just doing whatever we want all day. Um, but he thought it was recreation as a uh, as a way to um, you, you rejuvenate your mind, your body, your your, your soul, um, in order to return to the work that God has tasked you with. And so right. recreation is not simply for the for its own sake, not just to have fun, but it's for the but it's for the sake of serving others and living out the vocation that God has given you. And yeah. one of the examples he used with the teens, which is I think a great example, um, and a good illustration is uh, that of video games. Uh, a lot of people like to play video games, and, and if you're like me, and I'm sure you are, if you've uh, ever binged video games, I'm sure you have. I've seen you binging I don't, video I games. I haven't really binged video games in a long time. Ever? Really? I mean, I just played kid, for several I hours? I guess, you know, as a kid, maybe a couple hours. But oh, like even watching TV. I mean, just yeah. spending way too much time. It, it I just, I just want to make the point your... that I'm not really like you. But, but don't you want to be just like me, Jake? <laughs> I thought it was a hero. Yeah. Oh, there's a bunch of adorable kids walking by my window. Oh, that's cute. Catechesis is a good shepherd. Sorry, I distracted. Oh, um, that's all right. 
But in any case, uh, anime, it, if you binge video games or if you're a little bit older and you binge drink on a Saturday night or something along those lines, not only is it going to be difficult for you to go to communion on Sunday morning or even find a priest for confession in many cases, uh, you often wake up feeling not refreshed um, or if at the end of the video game you feel like your, your mind, you're, you're burned out, your, your eyes are tired, um, and you are totally exhausted from this activity that was supposed to relax you. Right. Whereas uh, spending time with your, your friends and your family and um, time in prayer and contemplating on the deeper mysteries of um, uh, the, the scriptures and what God has revealed to us is going to be a way to help you feel a lot better and to uh, make you more effective at the work that you're going to be doing the next day. Especially yeah, if you, and, in, and especially if you look at it um, with the uh, Monday in mind. Interesting. So if you ha- take Sunday with Monday in mind, um, what you can uh, do uh, is possibly avoid the Mondays. Um, I'm going to try this out next week, uh, next couple of weeks actually, is look at my Sundays as a way to uh, prep me for the next day of work. So we can look forward to it and say that I'm going to be empowered to do better this week than I did the week before. Mm-hmm. Let's do it, Jake. I want to forget about that. Just doing this, do, I don't know. Were you listening? I was in and out. Do you ever listen? Do you ever listen, Jake? I do. Excuse That's me. okay. I don't listen to me. Well, what what blame specifically you. is it that you were wanting to do? I don't know. I wasn't awesome. listening. <laughs> That's fair. I understand. So on the seventh day, we rest. Yeah. Where are you going with this, Jake? Oh, just that our rest looks different from what I think some people look at Sunday as is doing nothing. Oh, that's, well, that's how the uh, Hasidic Jews look at it, that you know, even pressing a button on an elevator is considered work, so you can't do that on a Sunday. Um, but for us as Christians, that's not what Sunday is about. Um, because we're called to imitate God. And what did he do on Sunday or the day after the Sabbath? He recreated. Christ rose on Sunday, not Saturday, for a reason, to show the, the work of the new creation. And so we're to recreate. We're not to, to do nothing. That was my point. All right. We can't not do nothing. I mean, we can't do nothing. Right. Yeah. We can't not do nothing. <laughs> let me just deconstruct that real quick here. Oh, my wife got me with a double negative statement the other day. I was well, trying to get not her. be so negative. I was trying. Well, you, you met my wife. <laughs> <gasps> just kidding. She's wonderful. Just, I do she love my wonderful. wife, though. Yeah, she's yeah, great. I like her. Um, very, she's conscientious. And, and that was uh, an interesting experience I had last week because I had to put together this uh, biographical interview for the state, which had the most awful questions. I mean, you and I have done quite a bit of uh, work in developing small group questions and uh, h- how to frame them in order to bring about something meaningful, but this uh, this questionnaire that they gave us was, just, was insane. I mean, number one, it would give you this really broad, uh, this very broad question, like, how do you cope with stress it's like mm. well, what kind of stress um and and when and like you know what kind of answers are you looking for here and do you want it to be bullet pointed do you want me to write more and then they give you like maybe a half inch line to write and then they expect you to fit everything in there um or they'd ask like five or six questions in one question some of which will you know contradict each other um depending on your answer mm-hmm. but anyway it was interesting because i got to spend more time thinking about my wife and would attract her, me to her and yeah. um, everything else. I'm going to stop going off that tangent so we can talk about the micro account of creation. Fair enough. So God creates Jacob. man and man is lonely. And so God creates woman out of Adam's rib. Probably all familiar with the micro account of creation. Uh, John Paul II masterfully looks at this in his work, Man and Woman, He Created Them, A Theology of the Body, which was uh, a great number of Wednesday audiences strung together um, through, uh, when did he start that? I think in 79. Yeah, 1979. So starting in the late 70s through the 80s, um, wonderful, masterful work uh, that he put together. And it begins with a question that the Pharisees posed to Jesus about 
uh, Moses and divorce. And Jesus' response is, it was not this way from the beginning. And so Jesus goes to the beginning. And, and so that's where John Paul II starts, is with Jesus' response and then looking at the beginning and what it means that God created man and woman and um, what does their bodily uh, creation and experience tell us about the nature of man. Um, and so it, it, he, he does a wonderful job, but um, specifically uh, for our purposes talking about creation, talking about the micro account of creation um, of this, um, you know, looking at the, the creation of all things but then with a, a magnifying glass or a microscope looking at this very specific moment of creating Adam and then creating Eve. Uh, and so that's, that's the road that we want to uh, go down for the remainder of the hour with time set aside for uh, more of Studi's tall tale. Oh, good. Good, good, good. Yeah. That's where we were. Now you think about that. Okay, um, you think about that, and I'll think about that, and you do nothing else. I'll do nothing else for the rest of the show. All right, so just silence for the rest of the show is what you want, yeah, so you can think? go for it, yes. Okay. It's going to be a pretty boring show. Yeah, I'm done. All right. So um, in this micro account of creation, we see Adam, uh, and then God makes all of the animals, uh, or presents the animals to Adam. And... One of the first things that God says is to have dominion over the earth. And so Adam begins naming all of the animals, which is done for multiple purposes. Um, the first purpose of which is to show that God is specifically giving power and dominion to Adam over creation. Uh, Studi, when, when your son was born, did you and your wife name him? We did. Or was it the doctors? Well, Michael actually named himself and That's his parents it. and the doctors as he came <laughs> out. <laughs> this is who you are. Serve wow. me. Uh, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, well, right. he's kind of intense. Um, well, of course I named him. I remember the first, the, what I did was, uh, you know, saw that it was a boy and I said, well, hello, uh, welcome. Uh, what was it? Uh, very happy to see you, Michael Ignatius. And uh, I said, it's a boy after that. Although, did I ever tell you my, my joke that I made in the midst yes, of all Yes, I was just going to ask you about that. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody else laughed. Molly was Except not. your wife, who's like Except my wife three was minutes like, actually postpartum. Literally labeled. No, no, she, no, it was, it was uh, just before she was giving birth. Oh. Just before she was going to start active, active pushing. Yeah, yeah. But the doctor, you know, as we were... Um, as the baby was about to come out, as Michael was about to come out, she said, uh, "John, do you want to uh, do you want to make the call? Do you want to tell me want to uh, call whether or not it's male or female, and a boy or girl?" And I said, "Doctor, I you know thank thank you for the honor, but I'm not sure I'm medically qualified to make that determination." <laughs> um, everybody laughed. Except Molly. Molly just told me to shut up. <laughs> Rightfully so too. But I thought it was pretty good. I'll take it. I mean, I'm yeah, that, was, that is pretty good. Um, so anyway, you, the doctors gave you uh, the chance to name your baby, and it really wasn't the doctors giving you the opportunity. The reason why you name Michael and your wife names Michael, uh, why, the reason why you guys do it together is that you have authority over him. You are the rightful parents, and he is your rightful heir. Mm -hmm. uh, he's your progeny. And so <clears throat> as scary as that prospect is, you have authority over him, uh, and so you are given the power to name uh, and, and that power is within natural law, uh, that the things we have dominion over, we name, we identify, we give a moniker to, uh, because that's part of our responsibility as being the, the authority over that thing or that person. And again, this is part of what makes us in the image and likeness of God, that God names something, but in his naming, the thing necessarily comes to be. So God says rock, God says tree, God says whatever it is, and that thing is. Um, for us, the thing already is, and we have dominion, and we give it the name uh, proper to it. And so that's one of the first purposes of God parading the animals in front of Adam, uh, so that Adam understands his own authority and dominion over the earth. The second purpose of it, though, 
is a negative anthropology. Uh, what does uh, Studi, what does Adam say uh, after he gets done naming all of the animals? The specific words? Well, you can paraphrase. That he couldn't find a, uh, he couldn't find a match or a partner. Yeah, there's not one of not one of these is like me. Yeah. Right. And so what what's happening here is that Adam is seeing these animals, and he says, "Well, there's something like me, or there's something similar to me in these, in the horse, and the dog, and whatever else, because they all have uh, animal souls. They have uh, souls that uh, can sense, they can move, they, you know, all the stuff, but." In the seeing, the everything from the mosquito to the cockroach to the, the dog, the horse, even though they're animate, he recognizes they're not like me. And in this, he recognizes his own solitude and his own aloneness. And he says, there is not one like me. Uh, and so in this, in order for Adam to uh, fully see the goodness uh, and truth of his spouse to be, his partner to be, uh, he has to first see his own solitude. He has to come to know who he is before he can give himself to his spouse. And likewise, he needs to see uh, the role of his spouse and who she is by what she is not in order to properly receive her. Um, and so it's, it's encountering the world and, and all of creation for uh, his own good first so that he might give and receive his spouse properly when she's made. Hmm. Hmm. Thoughts, Mr. Studi? I'm sorry, what'd you say? <laughs> no. I um, said, do you have any thoughts, Mr. Studi? Of course not. Of course not. Um, yeah, finding that similarity of oneself and uh, having another like you, so that you don't fall into uh, what, what was his name Walker Percy called um, the uh, um, into, into despair. Uh, and despair for him isn't the, or sorry, not I, not, not despair. I was. Uh, Isolation? No. Man, I'm losing my train of thought here. That's okay. Derailed. We'll talk about trains later. Um, <laughs> but to be to be separated from humanity, be separated again from the reality of the the world that you're made to be in. Um, in the in the scripture, it does say that man is, it is not good for man to be uh, to be by himself for for him to be alone. Um, right. And there's a reality to that. And I think one of the uh, major problems that we fall into um, with uh, as philosophers and theologians is when we examine the world around us and the sacraments of scientists as well. We often take it to a, a very high level abstraction um, and and remove the uh, concreteness of the uh, of our object of study away from um, away from the, the the study itself um, and mm -hmm. and the reality that we're living in so um, you'll you'll talk about uh, you're going to do these uh, you know high convoluted uh, crazy sounding metaphysical distinctions like you know the essence considered with distinction without distinction and then uh, distinction um, with exception or without exception um, but including things and it's just it just gets, this, this verbiage gets crazy and then you you don't actually pay attention to the reality that's in front of you and you remove yourself from the relationship uh, of uh, uh, that, we're, that we're supposed to have um, with the world around us and you see yourself merely as the king over it which I will note that um, or as, as something abstract and, and separated from it um, and I'll note that uh, in addition to the two points that you made, I think that the act of naming creative, the created things and the animals especially is a way that man participates in the creative action of God. Um, Absolutely. And he, participa yeah, he participates by recognizing what God has made. And so when we, when we name things, it's not with the exception of when we name things that we find uh, 
like lions and animals and over lions and uh, and bears and and trees and all those things. Uh, it's not merely nominal. Um, insofar as like when I saw Michael, I, we named him Michael, so we gave him a name by which we are going to call him. Um, mm-hmm. And Michael doesn't necessarily reflect the essence of what well Michael is, other than um, you know he right. is like God, which is what the uh, the name means because he is like God in that. He has uh, uh, he, he's made in the image of the likeness of God, and he so has really, phenomenal yeah. power. Um, really, we should name every child rational animal. We should. So it reflects the essence. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly how it goes. Perfect. But you know, you're t- you're talking about um, how how Adam says that none of these things are like me. Um, in a way, uh, we can take negative anthropology and take it and take it to the negative epistemology how do we come to know the essences that we are the things of our experience we we see a tree and at first you know especially when we're younger we we don't recognize it as tree with these particular properties and having this specific essence but rather uh and even even now when we're older when we encounter something we don't know what it is we simply recognize it as thing there is this mm-hmm. what in front of me. But it's through the uh, repeated exposure to these things and it's the comparison of one thing to another that we begin chipping away at this, quote unquote, it's a block of being, so to speak, until we mm-hmm. actually understand the form or, uh, or essence of this thing um, to, the, to a degree of possibility, the, the greatest degree of uh, knowledge that we can um, grasp. Um, and, we, and so it's by this negative way of, uh, of knowing what a thing is not that we, in a way, we find out what it is, in, mm-hmm. especially comparison into another thing um, is certainly very helpful. And a part of our coming to know the essences of things is that when an essence or form, which is, which a form uh, is defined, or a form, a form is the, the definition of a thing or the it answers the question of what is it, um, we look at, uh, we, we think of it in terms of, uh, in, in the mind as a uh, universal so it applies to all trees and so a, a tree is a uh, a growing as a as a plant that grows you know so uh, such uh, such and such a height and it has um, these specific functions and so that'd be the form of tree but the form of tree doesn't exist universally in any individual tree it only exists mm-hmm. in the mind um, nor does the form of tree exist uh, in some sort of platonic realm otherwise uh, a universal would also be a singular which is a direct contradiction in terms um, and so rejecting the platonic worldview but rather what we affirm as uh, um, Thomists is that every tree has its own uh, is its own individual essence, so that it is this tree's essence, and it includes the matter that it's made out of. If we're going to be very specific with it, um, and abstractly, we think of the the general matter of trees. So a tree can't be made out of goo, or a tree can't be made out of jello or glass or something like that, and really be called a tree because that matter is not properly oriented towards the the proper to the, the functions that are necessary to uh, be a tree. Um, but when it comes to the uh, um, but so when we so when we have this uh, discovery of the individual essences of the trees, what we do is we take the potential to be universal and abstract in the trees' essence, and we universalize it to treeness, mm-hmm. to, to the to the, the wholeness of the tree. Um, and in that way, what we do is we actually participate in the divine intellect, uh, from whom uh, the the trees' essence. Um, has its existence and has its uh, has its definition, and um, th- that tree participates. And uh, the uh, exemplar, so the the greatest, uh, uh, the the perfection of the perfect perfect consideration of what a tree is going to be, an oak or a uh, a pine tree or whatever it might be, um, is in the divine mind. Um, and we are like God in the sense that we understand the universal um, and general consideration of what a tree is. Uh, mm-hmm. And we participate um, in God's knowledge of that uh, through the way that he creates the individual trees in imitation of his own nature as an expression of his own goodness. And so when we come across the uh, the nature of a tree in itself and we uh, through the process of abstraction, extract away all the material bits and understand uh, treeness as tree, as opposed to a uh, tree as treeness, rather than uh, the tree as itself, as this individual thing in front of me. Um, we are making the uh, individual essence become 
universal uh, and are more connected with God um, in that sense because we've entered into a spiritual and abstract realm um, rather than simply staying here in the material. But the problem is, is that we'll so often uh, go above and beyond that. And Adam sees all these animals and, uh, and he recognizes that none of these other animals have that spiritual dimension to them, can, uh, can recognize and name other things and to abstract from individual essences the, the universal nature. Uh, and he is in despair. He becomes lonely, he becomes isolated uh, because there's uh, no one with whom he can connect with on the metaphysical level because he is a unique creature who lives um, on one side in the material realm and then on the other side in the spiritual realm. And um, as such, he uh, is um, unable to live a shared experience with any other. And to live a shared experience is, uh, I think, written into the very nature of what it means to be a being to exist, um, sure. and everything in a sense that has has that uh, that understanding of a, live, a lived experience in a way you could say almost say to the Trinity, because with the members of the Trinity, you have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, all of whom um, exist in a, a co-eternal relation, um, and so Adam was in isolation from others of his kind, and others who could relate to him on a, an existential level. Absolutely. And I think this is why we're such good friends, is that there's really no other humans that are quite like us. <laughs> Hopefully none. Yeah. None. Um, but in uh, Theology of the Body, one of the things that John Paul, uh, I think mean, this, is, this just speaks to his brilliance and what he knows. Um, so let's see here. i got to find my spot. So John Paul II says, at the same time, however, the Creator orders him to subdue and rule the earth. He is therefore placed above the world. Although man is so strictly tied to the visible world, nevertheless, the biblical narrative does not speak of his likeness with the rest of the creatures, but only with God. God created man in his image, and the image of God he created him. In the cycle of the seven days of creation, a precise step-by-step -step progression is evident. Man, by contrast, is not created according to a natural succession, but the Creator seems to halt before calling him to existence, as if he entered back into himself to make a decision. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. The level of this first account of creation, even if it is chronologically later, has above all a theological character. An indication of this is, above all, the definition of man based on his relationship with God, in the image of God he created him, which includes, at the same time, an affirmation of the absolute impossibility of reducing man to the world. Already in the light of the Bible's first sentences, man can neither be understood nor explained in his full depths with the categories taken from the world, that is, from the visible totality of bodies. What do you think of that, Studi? You know, Jake, I have to uh, <laughs> you cut out for a little bit there. Um, oh, did I? Landline right now. Yeah, I couldn't hear you. Oh. Could, you could you repeat that real quick? <laughs> real quick? Yes. How, how far down did uh, did he miss? Uh, go back to the beginning. <laughs> I really didn't hear much for the last, like, 30 seconds. Oh, so. uh, goodness. All right, Studi. At the same time, however, the Creator orders him to subdue and rule the earth. He is therefore placed above the world. Are you following me so far, Studi? Yes. Great. Although man is so strictly tied to the visible world, nevertheless, the biblical narrative does not speak of his likeness with the rest of creatures, but only with God. God created man in his image, and the image of God he created him. In the cycle of the seven days of creation, a precise step-by-step -step progression is evident. Man, by contrast, is not created according to a natural succession, but the Creator seems to halt before calling him to existence, as if he entered back into himself to make a decision. Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And the level of this first account of creation, even if it is chronologically later, has above all a theological character. An indication of this is above all the definition of man based on his relationship with God, in the image of God he created him which includes at the same time an affirmation of the absolute impossibility of reducing man to the world. 
Already in the light of the Bible's first sentences, man can neither be understood nor explained in his full depth with the categories taken from the world, that is, from the visible totality of bodies. Yes. That's my answer. <laughs> um, well, that's quite a bit. I mean, that, this is what John Paul II is just absolutely brilliant. Um, he... Uh, he says so much in, well, I mean, that was the terribly short paragraph, but or per- terribly short quote, but um, there's a, a lot to unpack there. And one of the things yeah. that stood out to me was the question of uh, the relationship between um, God and man versus the relationship between man and animal. If you, uh, if you look at the way that we uh, tend to think of ourselves in our contemporary context, it's largely in relationship to how do we compare to other animals? Are other animals as smart as humans? Um, what would count as a human? And one of the things that drives me nuts is like, could an AI ever you know, achieve human rights? <laughs> That's ridiculous because it's not going to be a human, so why should it get human rights? Um, right. Speaking of which, the, uh, there's one huge debate within Thomistic circles, um, which is a debate between the, the personalists um, and the, oh, what's the other one? Well, I forget the other name of the school, but uh, for some reason, right now, but long story short, there's two schools um, with respect to the question of human rights. Are they um, are they pre-political, or do humans only obtain rights once they enter into a political system? Um, mm-hmm. And there are uh, people who argue on both sides. Um, but what I argue for, what I believe, is that humans have pre-political rights, and so you don't uh, you don't need to have a uh, society in which you live in order for you to have uh, worth and value that, that ought to be respected and, um, and, uh, and, and treated with care by others if you, know, you happen to you know, kind of pop, your, pop into a community. Um, and the reason for that is because we uh, have as a fundamental part of our nature um, that image likeness of God. We have that participation um, in who he is in the, in the highest way. Um, mm-hmm. And when we act rationally, when we act, um, or when we act according to the good, so the right thing to do um, is going to be uh, acting in accordance with the reality around us, and the and the nature of the act itself, and the, the nature of our own um, of, a, of our own being, um, and when you're with a community of persons, if you're not interacting with one another, it's not simply out of my interest as a member of society that I don't like murder people um, <laughs> which is good but I, I recognize that uh, the good for myself is to live in harmony with others because I'm inherently a social animal um, and that the, the people who are around me are inherently those created in the image and likeness of God who is uh, who's very personhood is worth more than the totality of the material creation, as, the, as Jacques Maritain put it. And so the dignity and worth that I attach to somebody and the rights that are due to them, or that, that, that are not to be afforded to them, um, are not ones which merely derive from the social nature, the social uh, relationship or contract that we have, but rather it's a, it's a religious devotion. Um, it's a duty that we have to one another, but it's a duty to God uh, first and foremost, in recognizing that man is created for his own sake, and that man is created uh, to be in that relationship with God and to uh, be in his image. Mm-hmm. And if we abuse the image of the God who, uh, in whom all of our, our goodness and uh, happiness is to be found, then what we're going to do is, is, is ultimately say to God that we're going to abuse you. We're not loving uh, these very images of um, yourself and that who, who are part of our community. So the way that I see uh, human rights is that it's intrinsically bound up in that relationship with God. Um, and in, in that case, the uh, human rights, even though we're always born into a political society, um, so at least or it's not uh, uh, temporally prior. Um, they're not temporally prior, but rather they are logically or ontologically prior because our relationship to God um, precedes and transcends the relationships that we have with one another. Yeah. Well, were you saying that there are Thomists that argue otherwise? Yes. Because that doesn't make any sense, because if you were to equate human rights and, and human dignity, whatever else, 
as something flowing only from a political system or a society that you yourself enter into, then you would have no basis to appeal to natural law nor to divine law. Mm -hmm. The only grounding you would have would be on, on uh, human law. You, I don't think you can call yourself a Thomist and argue that. Yeah, I'll have to send you an article on that. You should. We should talk about this when we talk about politics sometime. We should. Um, oh, yeah, speaking of which, there's a, we should talk after our show here. Okay. We'll talk. We'll talk. We'll talk. Oh, we only have 11 minutes left. We um, do. Yeah. Whoa, whoa. But really just like a couple so you can you know tell, tell more of your story. We should. I think my story is um, going to be great. I forget where we are, by the way. You, let's see, the, the young man, mm-hmm. we'll come back to that. I think I remember where we are. Um, one of the other things that John Paul II points out here, uh, he says, to the mystery of his creation in the image of God, he created him corresponds the perspective of procreation, that is, be fruitful and multiply, of coming to be in the world and in time, of fieri, which is necessarily tied to the metaphysical situation of creation of contingent being. Um, ultimately, this harmony of man and woman uh, and the, the uh, spousal and conjugal meaning of the body is a participation in the creative genius of God. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so part of this, of man's solitude prior to the woman coming, is a preparation of man for this conjugal spousal union. And we see this, man is uh, sad that he's alone. And if you read in scripture, it's not just the words that are important, but also how they're written, that when Eve is made and Adam uh, awakes from his deep slumber, he says, at last, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But he doesn't say it because what the way that it is formulated in scripture is that it's indented into prose. And so it's meant to be poetic or even understood as a song. That he cries out in, in joyful singing, at last, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, that his joy cannot be contained even to the point that he sings for love of his beloved. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's in this singing out for joy of his beloved that man, in, it's in part at this point, that man recognizes in some fashion his participation in God's creative genius by coming together with his partner in order to be fruitful and multiply. That in this, they're reflecting the beauty of God, and they can't help but be joyful of it. Yes, uh, I completely completely agree. Uh, That is one of the, I mean, you don't think, let me back up. Okay, let me say this. Okay, so uh, in the account that you just gave, when God when Adam falls into a deep sleep, um, in the Septuagint, the word that's used for that deep sleep is actually ecstasis, which means a uh, an ecstasy. An ecstasy, yeah. So it's yeah. related. It has the same root word, and so he he goes into this uh, this this deep contemplation, this deep ecstasy. If you ever see the ecstasy, what is it? Ecstasy of Saint Therese, or um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it you know it looks like she's. Uh, and uh, the highest states of, uh, of physical joy or, or, or pleasure. Um, and uh, this is the same kind of um, joy that Adam gets when he encounters the partner with whom God has uh, joined him um, to, to be a, uh, somebody who, who walks with him on um, the path of life and is supposed to, uh, uh, with whom he's supposed to participate in that creative genius of God. Um, and so when he expresses himself in that way, it's not uh, it's not a, a cold statement like you were saying, but it's a it's a poem, it's a song, which expresses right. a reality that's too deep for uh, logical words or for rational words. Um, and I think that there's an element of that uh, in the uh, in the in the experience of love in itself and the love that we we ought to have for one another and the love that we ought to have for God is that. Um, people will say things like love is irrational. I think that's a foolish thing. Uh, love, love, as Saint, as Saint Paul tells us, always seeks the truth, and something that's irrational can't seek the truth. It's, it's super rational. Um, it's super yeah. rational in the sense that it goes above and beyond our uh, ability to properly define it or properly uh, uh, give it a, a singular characteristic. Because love, um, which is uh, Saint John says, essentially the, the, the very nature of God, um, is what we're encountering in a participated or a or a, um, 
uh, demarcated way, um, especially when we speak of the conjugal when we speak of conjugal unions or the love that you have with your spouse and joining in in that uh, creative aspect uh, right. of of God's genius. Well, maybe we can pick this up some more next week. I'll mark my page here because um, it. I mean, obviously, theology of the body and this micro account of creation is more than we can do in you know 45 minutes when we take out the fact of our obligatory nonsense. So, Mr. Studio. Well, if you recall from two weeks ago. As I say, last time, if you recall, you just got done explaining uh, a bit uh, about all of the uh, disasters that our young, uh, our, our young train-loving friend had encountered. Yeah, it was a uh, it was rather unfortunate if you if you remember he had uh he had as a very young man in his in his preteen state uh caused several disasters within his own home and eventually he uh along with some neighborhood neighborhood friends put together a train a working train that uh went around the whole neighborhood and eventually they uh, they uh, find they found a way to get it a tunnel underground. I mean it was very ingenious. Um and uh, uh, they used these lawnmowers um, to. Uh, they took out the engines and used used that for propulsion. Um, and they were able to to take that that train basically anywhere in the the city where they commonly had uh, uh, hangouts. You know, the school, the, the coffee shop, uh, the, uh, the the movie uh, store. There's no movie stores anymore, but there were back at the store <laughs> time. Um, but in any case, uh, and this you know went well went fairly well for a while. I mean the. Uh, the man was very uh, reckless with the, the train, often pushing it beyond its boundaries, and it broke down often because he didn't take care of it very well. And um, and there and there were times where he was uh, not not running the trains on time, and um, just just very it wasn't very good at this uh, at taking care of this whole uh, whole whole train system that he had put together. And his friends got kind of upset with him, so eventually he decides to kind of scrap the whole idea, and he uh, takes the train and. Uh, Folds, uh, pushes it forward full throttle, um, and he eventually crashes into uh, a, <clears throat> a fire hydrant after he derails a train, which caused a massive fire in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And being he lived in a in, in a kind of a rural area, uh, not too much was thought about this issue uh, of, of him and his friends building a train um, out of lawnmower engines. Uh, but once the crash happened, they they had some issues, um, and so this this little you know young boy went to uh, juvenile detention for a little while, um, not not too long because they you know, saw him not as somebody who had uh, any real criminal intent and wasn't malicious and had a great record otherwise, which is largely being behaved. That they uh, they eventually let him go. I mean, so he was only in there for a couple of months. And it was over the summer, um, and so he gets back to school. And, uh, and during his senior year, um, he looks forward to what he's going to do for college. And he looks at all the different majors: accounting, business, uh, philosophy, and says, "You know, none of these things are for me." And what does he do? Well, he goes to train conducting school, um, and he he's dying to be a, a conductor. Um, and his parents bar him from doing so. And as a result of this, he runs away from home before he even turned 18. And he, uh, and he lived uh, next to a, a train station several states to the west. And he, uh, uh, as a as, you know, young vagabond, um, eventually uh, started hopping the trains. And the train conductor who was on board that day, uh, on board the train that he was uh, uh, that he was living on, um, took a liking to him and kind of, and took him in under his wing, um, something as a surrogate father, and uh, especially since he, the young boy felt a rejection from his parents over the issue of trains, uh, he really took a liking to this uh, train conductor. And not too long after, he uh, actually got a job working for the railroad company um, as an assistant to this conductor and learned everything he could uh, from this you know, this elderly man. And uh, he earned enough money to go to school and get his train conducting license. And the problem was that while he was there, um, as passionate as he may have been and as uh, dedicated to the studies and um, that he as, as he as he was, he barely graduated, um, and really only then it was it was due to the fact that the, he showed some some promise, um, and they and they they recognized the uh, the ingenuity that he had, the creative ways that he went about solving various problems that come up come up during uh, tr- 
train conducting episodes, whatever those might be. Um, he, was, he was genius at it. The best. Huge, really. Huge. Huge. But as he... Uh, we we should probably uh, you got about a minute left here, Mr. Studi. Well, he graduated, and he was granted his very first conducting assignment with, interestingly enough, one of those bullet trains that goes over 300 miles per hour. Because they figured with his ingenuity and his creativity that that might be the best place for him to go, where he can exercise his unique talents. We're going to stop there because I'll always forget. Very good. Unique so, talents is where we're at. Unique talents. So, Jacob, will you take us out? Um, yeah, we should probably get lunch. Where do you want to go? I, hmm, you haven't done sushi in a long time. We need to get all you can eat sushi. We do. Maybe after we finish renovating your basement. In any case, my name is Jacob Nelson, and along with me is Mr. John Studi. We are your hosts of the Lost Voice Radio program, hosted with WCAT Radio. If you wish to email us, please do so at lostvoice at wcatradio.com. Have a blessed week in the Lord. God bless. We hope you enjoyed the program, and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.